Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, um, a real pleasure to be back here in Morocco. Um, when I first received the invitation and uh, saw the subject matter, um, I have to say I was um, very intrigued. Um, it's certainly a very topical subject, uh, not just for this region, um, but also um, for my own country, for my region and really a good for all democracies in the world how to manage beyond <coughs> populism. Um, brief introduction, uh, Thailand uh, became a democracy uh, 80 years ago uh, when we moved from absolute monarchy to constitutional monarchy. But in between that period, we had 17 coups. Uh, the last one was only seven years ago. So in many ways, uh, I would still consider us uh, very much um, a democracy in, in transition also, and one that is struggling with very similar issues uh, that the uh, new democracies around the world in this region are uh, having to face. Um, in Thailand, in fact, uh, we are pondering the question of the challenge of populism. Um, and the term has recently been a point uh, that populism is very much a democracy trap, uh, something that um, most democracies find difficult to, to escape um, as politicians compete uh, with increasing the populist policies to, to revoke. So, as a politician, the question is that we face is how to win elections um, without excessive populism and as a former finance minister, how to ensure uh, that competing politicians um, are not given blank checks uh, to destroy stability and sustainability uh, of the long-term economy. Having said that, uh, we are also very aware uh, that especially in new democracies, the people must be able to feel and touch, uh, which first of all began uh, as policies that were frankly quite rational. For example, the provision of uh, free health care, free education, um, about 10 years ago. Um, Thailand is still very much an agricultural country, uh, so policies that involved um, the government uh, introducing a mortgage scheme for our main crop, uh, which is rice, so that farmers could pledge a uh, substantial portion of that crop uh, with the government at 30 or 40 percent uh, below market price. Uh, there were also populist policies that were quite rational um, in helping the uh, general population get out of that debt trap uh, by um, providing refinancing opportunities with state-owned banks. All these were uh, what I would call rational um, and affordable uh, populist policies. But then as competition in the political arena increased, uh, what we found was that uh, um, these policies, which all started out being somewhat rational, became increasingly irrational. So that today, for example, the rice mortgage scheme has morphed from one whereby government uh, provides mortgage at 30% below market price to governments providing a mortgage uh, to every single grain of rice uh, producing rice at a price uh, that is 40% higher uh, than the world price. Um, and what has happened back home is that, of course, all this rice now sits in government warehouses, uh, almost 20 million tons of it. Um, we've dropped up the scale from being the number one export of rice in the world to last year being third. Um, substantial losses to the government and um, yeah, a significant impact to budget deficits. Uh, loans that used to be refinanced um, were simply waived um, in uh, competing uh, in, in, in the uh, effort by politicians to compete for those. Um, now that we've given uh, all Thai children free education, uh, the most recent government uh, started uh, introducing more obvious schemes of giving them computer tablets for free um, into schools in some businesses that didn't have proper access to electricity. Um, a very good example of uh, irrational uh, populist policies most recently um, 
was a scheme whereby the government gave uh, significant tax rebates uh, to buyers of cars. Uh, if you've been to Bangkok, um, or if you've been to Chicago, uh, my colleague uh, come from, you will see that one of our biggest problems, in fact, is the um, traffic problem. Um, so it's completely rational that the government has stimulated the uh, uh, Bangkok population to purchase uh, an additional one million cars in a year. Um, as a result of this uh, tax rebate scheme, which, by the way, is so expensive that the loss in revenue to the government um, could have allowed us to build about 25 kilometers of uh, mass transit underground train um, with, with the money that we, we lost in that scheme. So these policies are increasingly making uh, policymakers and economists worried uh, about the long-term consequences and raises the question um, as to how uh, these populist policies began in the first place, importantly how to break the cycle. Um, it raises the question also, of course, as to whether all populism is bad. Um, we ask the question uh, as to whether voters are actually ignorant of the dangers what are the alternatives, and very importantly, how are these policies to be paid for? I'm not going to provide answers to all these questions, but I'm hoping that um, in the discussions that will be followed, we will be able to address them. But as we all know, uh, democracy is a number of games. Um, there are sets of rules in terms of how the game is played, and whenever there are sets of rules, there will be people who are going to feel the field that they can gain it. Use the rules um, uh, in order to uh, to win the game. So it's very important, always, for us politicians to understand uh, that whether voters go into the party uh, in any democracy, they'll be asking the question: What is it? In, what is in it for me? And the more enlightened the electorate, uh, the more the answer uh, is to do with broader benefits of society has to benefit directly uh, to be received by them as an individual. Uh, but of course, in emerging democracies, we usually find also uh, poorer populations, uh, less educated populations. Um, this becomes uh, a particular challenge and an opportunity for uh, politicians to, to abuse. Um, therefore, I think what is important uh, from the perspective of policy making is that we build firewalls, firewalls to ensure that that the scarce results that are available for the important task of uh, building competitiveness uh, for our economies through infrastructure and through sustainable social welfare, and also uh, measures the firewalls that are put in place to ensure that there is no excessive uh, strain on the budget um, and no excessive uh, national debt that is built up as a result of increasing competition in the public sphere. So, for example, um, we already have in place, but are considering uh, enhancing uh, the firewall uh, to curtail the level of uh, national debt um, in absolute terms. Um, whether there should be a national debt ceiling, um, also in terms of a cap on annual budget deficit, and total ceiling on overall uh, gross debt. There is consideration at the moment also as to whether we should in fact require that uh, all populist policies or policies that can be deemed to be populist uh, are paid for um, by direct government revenues. Um, so, for example, uh, governments will be able to borrow to build infrastructure, uh, but government cannot borrow uh, to, to fund policies uh, that uh, demand <coughs> cash payments. And those policies um, will, uh, can only be financed uh, by tax revenues, which will lead to the question, of course, of how to um, broaden uh, your tax base. And, um, and that is something that I think we can also uh, discuss. Um, I think it's important also to lay the foundation uh, for private sector participation. I think all uh, nation states um, have examples to draw from, especially in my part of the world, uh, you may be tempted to feel uh, that economies are successful because um, at, at the 
feature states in my career. Uh, they're directed by the state. Um, I feel that that may be a mistake. Um, my own personal view uh, is that it's, it is best to, at an early stage, uh, put in the uh, legal framework that will enable and encourage private sector participation uh, as early and as much as, as possible. Um, this involves uh, legislation um, regarding public and private sector participation, uh, legislation uh, looking at issues such as foreign ownership, uh, limits in, in local corporations, um, and uh, regulations that would help encourage foreign investment and at the same time uh, limit uh, economic rent, usually derived from from restriction of foreign participation in order to protect uh, domestic companies, which, frankly speaking, quite often uh, do not deserve to be uh, protected. But these are all uh, important uh, and uh, sensitive issues, um, which uh, I hope we'll be able to discuss further. Most important, um, in order to get all this right and, and do it in such a way that the uh, people feel that they are benefiting from in a fair and transparent manner is to put in place uh, a government system, um, a regulatory system, uh, in a transparent manner uh, as early as possible. And I'd be happy to discuss uh, with all of you uh, examples that have uh, been uh, workable and some of them.